So what time does the 7 o'clock meeting start? 7 o'clock! Thank you, 7 o'clock. So welcome to Position of Neutrality. Welcome to New Freedom. Uh, before we begin all of 2023, we have been opening Position of Neutrality with a prayer because we have a chaplain in the house. Chaplain Lee, will you come open us up? Can everybody please stand to your feet? Ah, oh, this is a beautiful crowd. Father, we thank you on tonight. We thank you for another opportunity to be in your presence. We thank you for what you're doing in this place. Tonight, God, as we prepare to go into the 12th step, after being awakened and recognizing, Lord, that you're down on the inside of us, strengthening us, we shall go out and carry this message to others because we know it works. So we thank you tonight for the instructions that we're going to get to move forward. We thank you for everything you're doing. We ask you to bless your man servant as he speaks tonight. And we give you all the praise in advance for what you're going to do. Bless those that are on their way. Let them come in with a mind to be ready to receive. And forever we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. amen. Thank you, chap. Um, so first of all, anyone here for the very first time tonight? Oh good, a bunch of you. Great. So welcome. And let us warn you in advance, you're liable to experience us just a little different than other meetings of other fellowships you may have attended. And the primary reason that's liable to happen is we intend for you to have a different experience here. What we do here, we've done for lots of years now. We take a look at the suggested instruction for a step or so a week directly out of this book. And we use this book in 12-step recovery. Why? Yeah, the process described by the authors of this book has been proven to work, right? And it, it restores addicts of the hopeless variety, addicts to alcohol and other substances. Yes, this process reveals this power to us through us. So tonight we're going to talk about that. As Chap already told you, we're going to be looking at the suggested instruction for step 12. And I will call to your attention that in this group, um, we share a spiritual experience every time we come together. And in 12-step recovery, when we speak of a spiritual experience, we're talking about a sensory experience. You will feel it. And when you do, I'll know, and I'll call it to your attention. Because we would cheat you to talk to you about the power we call God without giving you a demonstration. Fair enough? All right, and then i got to do one more thing. A young man who is the son of one of our members here really appreciated that he was getting his dad back. And he went out and spent his birthday money on these Nikes for me. And what I want to tell you is Stryker at 10 knows more about the 12th step than probably any of us in the room. So this isn't a story about me having new shoes or about anything that anyone here is doing for his dad, but his selfless act is what we want to call your attention to. Thank you, Stryker. So we're in chapter seven of our book, and it's a chapter entitled Working with Others, if you're following along. And if you're not following along, that's fine. I would only caution you to be careful about letting other people read your book for you. So, it says, practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. Any of you notice some promises and conditions in that little statement? Yeah. Other activities will fail. <laughs> John's gone straight Debbie Downer on us. Anyway. Yeah. But he calls to your attention that that's something we don't often tell people, right? That all these, what are these other activities they're talking about? 
any number of things we've heard short of offering ourselves as servants. We're going to have to find out how to serve, and we don't all serve in the same way, but if we don't serve, if we fail to grow along spiritual lines, we will return to the addictive insanity. That's their witness. Does it make sense? Okay. And then it also says that intensive work with alcoholics works when other activities fail. So it's not that bad a news that they will, but I need to confront my fears that either I'm not good enough or I don't know the process well enough. Well, I don't know it well enough to show someone else I might screw them up. Any of you ever think of that? The guy that took me through the steps was a little raw. He says, don't worry, Joe. You cannot fuck them up any worse than they already are. <laughs> so armed with the facts about yourself, you can generally win the confidence of another in a few hours. Yes? This whole place is based on a pure model. How many of you got written to while you were inside? How many of you hadn't really given a lot of thought to what a life beyond prison was going to look like until you started writing and find out there was a place built for you to get your feet under you so that you could walk out in victory and take your community back and bring your family back? How many of you didn't know that until you started? Was it credible because it was a peer writing you? When you got here and everybody ran up to you and said, Welcome home! Welcome home. Did it scare you? Yeah. Did you find out we meant it? How many of you went to AA rooms and got the same experience? You think it's by accident? <laughs> okay, good. So, it says, this is our 12th suggestion, colon. So that means the 12th suggestion follows. So it's not the selfish reason they just told me. The reason I might want to work with others is not because I'm such a great guy, but other activities are going to fail, and this works when they do. Right? But the 12th suggestion follows. It says, carry this message to other alcoholics. Carry what message? Service works when other activities fail. Yes? You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they're very ill. Why do you think when someone wants you to show them that they pick someone unqualified? Is that fear in you? We need to confront that fear. Seven billion plus people on the planet, and of all those people, this person was directed to you, and you think they've mistaken it? Maybe you ought to step up and serve. If you're unqualified, let's get you qualified. Right? Does the start make sense? Okay. We're not qualified by accomplishment in recovery, folks. We're qualified by identity. The signature of the spirit. Yes? Okay. So life will take on new meaning. Now they're starting to give us some promises of this life of service. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you'll not want to miss it. So how many of you have had the experience, even in your short term here or in recovery, seeing the fellowship grow up about you when you started? Okay. Would you have wanted to miss it? So we're right on track. This is, this is because our world gets very, very small in active addiction, doesn't it? Okay, so it says frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. That's why you're told welcome home. Because we really mean it. And we want to see you come to life. And we do see you come to life. How many of you got here at first and were a little standoffish? How many of you pretty soon were sticking your hand out saying, man, this is what you got to do. Here's what you got to go with. Perhaps you're not acquainted with any drinkers who want to recover. You think that's true in Phoenix, Arizona today? So you can easily find some by asking a few doctors, ministers, priests, or hospitals. They'll be only too glad to assist you. Don't start out as an evangelist or reformer. What's that look like? Is that the evangelist or the reformer? So an evangelist with my mouth is not what I'm called to be, but an evangelist with my life is exactly what I'm called to be. And, and so 
if I'm talking and it isn't lining up with my walking, I'm not doing very good evangelism. And a reformer is somebody who just wants to tell me it's all alcohol's fault. It's all methamphetamine's fault. Right? It's all cocaine's fault. Clearly it's not the drug's fault. I'll tell you why I know that. Because those drugs did for me what I expected them to do right up to the time when I could no longer survive no matter how anesthetized I was. So they never failed me. I just wasn't tough enough to finish the mission. <laughs> so unfortunately, a lot of prejudice exists. You'll be handicapped if you arouse it. Ministers and doctors are competent, and you can learn much from them if you wish. But it happens that because of your own drinking experience, you can be uniquely useful to other alcoholics. Why is it that I can be uniquely useful to another alcoholic? Because I know the depths of the death of the spirit within me. I know how it feels. I know how I think. And I'm no longer there. Now, if I'm not armed with the facts about myself, I'll tell you something about what I did to produce that. But properly armed with the facts about myself, there is nothing that I could do to produce that. I was a dead man. Anyone relate? to what I'm talking about? And then I was snatched up and put in another place. And so that is the story that I can tell. Okay. All right. So cooperate, never criticize. To be helpful is our only aim. When you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about them. How might I do that? All of those are true. You might go to a meeting. You might go to a recovery center. You might just meet them on the street. But if you're talking more than you're listening, you probably miss the instruction. Because you don't find out all you can about somebody by talking to them. You find out all you can about them by listening to them. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. You might spoil a later opportunity. How many of you had the experience of someone trying to tell you that drugs were not good for you? <laughs> Did you conclude, like me, that my problem was not the drug, but your attitude about my drug use? <laughs> so what they're telling you is you might spoil a later opportunity. They have to be prepared as I had to be prepared. I am prepared through this process of arming myself with the facts about myself, making amends for harms done, growing in consciousness through prayer and meditation, and serving others. And as I'm prepared, they're getting prepared out there in the first step experience to realize this ain't turning out good. How many of you could be convinced when the evidence was all around you that it was not going well? Okay, so if there is any indication he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him. Oh, I'm sorry. I, went, I jumped, but I'm going to keep jumping. <laughs> because I don't even want to talk about the family right now. A lot of us, a lot of us our family of origin is the problem. <laughs> like, I know many of you have told me that the family business was incarceration. And so we don't want to go right back to that. Um, I'm going to jump over to page 91. We're, more, we're going to meet people more likely in fellowships to Paul's Point or around treatment centers or wherever we find people. So it says, see your man alone if possible. How many of you have been blessed with a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps and are endeavoring to work with others? Good, a good percentage of you. The rest of you will be raising your hands soon if you want to get well. Not because it's a rule, but because the inventory just gets me to the facts. And then I take the facts to the truth. And the truth demands that I go out and convert that past into something useful to help my brothers and sisters. And if I don't do that, the house cleaning never gets done. So it says, see your man alone if possible. So those of you who meet them in the rooms, how do you do that? Get in the car. <laughs> Sean kidnaps them. Anyone else? Do you know why he says that? We've been doing this shtick for years. But the reason he says that is what's your normal experience in a, in a recovery room if you announce that you're a newcomer? 
You get sworn, but a lot of people have an opinion about your life. But they had just met you, so they're really not well informed about your life. Right? And we're, just, we're poking fun because we all do it. It's enthusiasm, but the fact is, if we're following instruction, that's not the best approach. Okay. All right, so at first engage in general conversation. What's that sound like? Yeah, where'd you grow up? Did you see the game last night? Haven't seen you around here before. You work around here? New to the area? What do they usually hear? You got a sponsor yet? <laughs> Read the first 164 pages. Call me. You, you get the drift, right? It's sort of the bum's rush, but it's because we haven't followed instruction. How many of you, when you first started getting involved in this process, found that guy that just always had a warm handshake, gave you some space, seemed genuinely interested in you, and didn't really press for what you were up to. Waited for you to come and say, what's up, what's different? Okay. So it says, after a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. So what are your drinking habits, symptoms, experiences? And can you do it without speaking in Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes. <laughs> Some of us tend, we go all clinical on them. You know, if you've been in AA and you meet in AA, you're like, ugh, one of those. How, how many of you have had that? <laughs> yeah. So drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences. So it, although they talk about craving and obsession, for me it wasn't a clinical experience, it was just a, a life experience that was baffling. I knew it was not safe for me to do one mind-altering substance, not one, not ever. That fact did not stop me from doing it over and over and over again. I wasn't ill-informed about the outcome. I did not do the same thing expecting a different result. Remember some drunk said that, not this drunk. This drunk said I had an appalling lack of perspective. I'd been, I, I was in, unable to think clearly. That's what they said. I did the same thing expecting exactly the result I was going to get. I had no expectation. of That's what hopelessness is. No expectation of a different result. This is going to suck. Watch. You guys know what I'm talking about? You feel me? Who's feeling that? Okay. Okay. So then it says, if he wishes to talk, let him do so. You'll thus get a better idea of how you ought to proceed. They'll tell me what they're willing to hear. If I'll just wait and not assume I know what they need to hear, they will tell me what they're willing to hear and what they're capable of hearing. And then I can proceed. How many of you have learned that? How many of you have had people tell you what you needed to hear and you retain none of it? It sounds like the Charlie Brown teacher. <laughs> If he's not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit, but say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. Why did they tell us that right there? Lance says, I have no idea. Sean says, you'll scare him away. Both of those are true. Do you guys get what we're talking about? How many of you that were just radically ripped from everyday addiction in the depths and all of a sudden on a different trajectory and have any idea how that happened? Yeah, that is above my pay grade. I cannot talk to you about how. I can only talk to you about who. And it wasn't me. Make sense? Okay. So we don't want to hit them with that like in, in the first couple minutes because that's, to Sean's point, maybe a bit much. And the reality is it's going to come with power and it may be, may be a little much. Okay. If he's in a serious mood, dwell on the trip, or trip troubles liquor has caused you being careful not to moralize or lecture. So what do they mean? They don't want to be the reformer. So I don't want to talk about the evils of drinking, and I want to talk about the human condition I exhibited while I was out in the depths of my addiction. In other words, I don't want to describe myself as a piece of crap or some of the things we hear people do. That, I know it's entertaining, but when I'm sitting there in the depths of my addiction looking for help, I'm not hearing them tell me about them. I'm hearing them tell me about me. So what I need to tell them 
is I know how bad you feel because I can feel you feeling that way, but I'm here to tell you that at my worst and at my best, I was a child of the living God. And when I came here and I started walking out this manner of living, I proved that fact to me, through me. And if I'm here with you, he is not a respecter of position, so yours is here today. Right? So if he's in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you, being careful not to moralize or lecture. If his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your escapades. Get him to tell some of his. How many of you have gone to the meeting after the meeting, the meeting before the meeting, and started swapping lies? <laughs> and we get to chuckle a little bit until someone hits a nerve and then it's sad, but then we... We expose our trauma, and we find out it's safe to expose our trauma, and then maybe I want to get a little closer and take a little deeper look. And does it make sense? Okay. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were and how you finally learned that you were sick. So how did you finally learn that you were sick? And Sean says that, and that was true for him, but how many of you landed in lots of detoxes? How many of you landed in all kinds of places where you just detoxed because that was the thing you did in those kind of places? And one didn't stop you. So how many of you are still in recovery and still question the idea that addiction is an illness instead of a moral failing? That's common. It's very common. So if you don't believe in mental illness and don't believe specifically that, that addictive disorder is a mental illness, you'll say things like, if you just stay sober for a year, I might work with you. You're just not willing. Dude, if, if I could stay sober for a year, I wouldn't need you. So, so more condemnation on top of my self-condemnation has no possibility of penetrating me and my insanity. Right? So when they talk about this allergic reaction, the physical manifestation of an allergy, a lot of people make jokes about that, but let's, let's review so we understand there is actually characteristics, physical characteristics. Do I have any drinkers in the room? When you drank, did you find that alcohol energized you? Yes! Okay, it's a sedative. So that would be an abnormal reaction to the sedative alcohol. Does it make sense? What an allergic manifestation is, is an abnormal reaction to the general population. So if you, where's my meth addicts? Did you find that shit calm you down? Need I say more? That is an abnormal reaction to a very powerful stimulant. Where's my opiate addicts? When you got hooked up, you were like on it, right? <laughs> Give me a little Delata, I'll go out in the smoking lounge. <laughs> I can have the dope dealer pull to the parking lot. When I'm out, everyone thinks I'm on. And when I'm tapped in, everyone thinks I'm doing good. And it's very confusing to the outside world and particularly baffling to us, right? But that's the physical manifestation. And in our human condition, we have abnormal reactions to lots of things, don't we? <laughs> the old timers told me that one of the things that we got to learn is that alcoholics pole vault over mouse turds. <laughs> so little, little upsets will send us off the rails. And massive trauma and catastrophe, we're like, what? So it says, give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. How, show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. So what's that for you? That's what the steps are going to help you with. How many of you had some clean time? And then you're at work and you're with everybody and somebody says, hey, man, we're going to go out and have a few after work. Been a hard week. I just want to relax. And you're sitting there thinking, I don't pick up no matter what. I'd like to relax. Why can't I relax? Yeah. Any of you ever had that happen to you? Yes. How many of you went and found out why? Because yeah. they went home and I went and lived under a bush. That's why I can't do it. <laughs> so 
That's just me, but that's an abnormal reaction. Okay. Okay. So they say we suggest you do this as we've done it on the chapter on alcoholism. If he's an alcoholic, he'll understand you at once. So on the chapter on alcoholism, they talk about Jim the car guy. They talk about what's the fellow's name that Fred. 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 Fred, normal in every respect, business guy, not as bad as those alcoholics who talked to him. So he didn't need to do any of that stuff. But then a few months later, he goes to New York, picks up a drink casually, comes to three days later in a cab. Jim, the car guy, you may relate more to him. He didn't even start drinking until he's older. He owned a car dealership. He lost the car dealership due to his drinking. And he had to go to work for the car dealership he once owned. And he recounts, he was on his way to work, and he had a bit of a disturbance. He was a little agitated, he says. Any of you ever gone to work in a diminished capacity and felt a little agitated? <laughs> so that's what happened to Jim. And on his way to this car dealership, he's a little agitated. He has a few words with the boss, nothing serious. Any of you ever had a few words with the boss that you can considered non-serious? After he has that discussion with the boss, he decides that although he's at the car dealership where people come to buy cars, he's going to go out in the woods looking for people who want to buy cars. <laughs> now you all laugh, but tell me there's no one in here that went down to the trap house just to show the fellows how good you were doing. <laughs> I need to get out of here a minute and clear my thoughts. So on his way out to these woods where car buyers hang out that don't come to dealerships, he passes a roadside place where they have a bar. And he wasn't worried about that because he'd been there many times and he doesn't pick up no matter what. But this time he's sitting there and he has a sandwich and a glass of milk and then the thought comes to him, you know, if I ordered another sandwich and a shot of whiskey, could not hurt me on a full stomach. And the experiment went so well, he had another. <laughs> and then another. And then another trip to the asylum for Jim. Any of you relate to that? Thought, you know, how bad could it be? Where's my people that really had a drug issue that you could identify? But you thought, you know, it would be all right to just have a drink. And pretty soon it's seven drinks and an eight ball. <laughs> okay, so if you went with me on any of those journeys, it says if, if, if he's alcoholic, he'll understand you at once. He'll match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. Did any of you play along? Did you match your mental inconsistency with some of those I was describing? Well, unfortunately, you've just caught alcoholism. But luckily, we're in a book. There is a solution. Does it make sense? Okay. So then it says, if you're satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. So what is the hopeless feature of the malady, given that I've determined that this person I'm sitting with is indeed like me? Frothy emotional appeal is not going to fix it. Whatever message is going to have to have depth and weight. I've got to be properly armed with the facts about myself. I've got to see where he is first. Right? All of those things. Okay? So it says, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. I can't dwell on it for them. I'm not qualified. I can only, I'm an expert in my own experience, period. So I can talk to them about how I once thought and felt as they do. But I don't think I'd have made much progress had I not taken action. This is the action I took. This is what I experienced as a result. And I've got to dwell on the fact that I tried all kinds of solutions short of the solution found within me. Does that make sense? And then they'll do what they do. Okay. So show him from your own experience how the queer mental condition surrounding that first drink prevents normal functioning of the willpower. Don't at this stage refer to this book unless he's seen it and wishes to discuss it. And be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Let him draw his own conclusion. If he sticks to the idea that he can still control his drinking, 
tell him that possibly he can if he's not too alcoholic. <laughs> Some of you are chuckling. The reason I suspect we're laughing is that none of us want to be told we're not addict enough. So we're really not throwing them under the bus. I need them to convince me. You need to learn to ask for help. And right now you think you're asking me, but no, you're, you're asking this form, and I am a distributor of the help you're asking for, but that's all you can receive right now, so that'll do. Does that make sense? And I need to, to be pretty clear about that with them, because I admitted I was powerless over alcohol, and... That still remains true, but I have gained access to power that operates in and through me and is now offering itself to them through me. Yes? Okay. And so what I need to do is if they think they can control it, then encourage them to do so. And otherwise, just talk to what I learned from my experience. How many of you learned a lot about your own experience in addiction? And, and it was really baffling, and a lot of people didn't believe you'd ever get well. And then you found yourself talking to a lot of people that had similar experiences. It's very frustrating when we see people dying in addiction, and we don't remember that it wasn't that long ago that we were dying in addiction. All right, so... Um, i got to get down to continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of body and mind which accompany it. So what are the conditions of body and mind which accompany it? That, that abnormal reaction, but then even with the knowledge it's not going to turn out well for me, somehow I just decide life is just too difficult to live unmedicated, or I give no conscious thought at all. Someone hands it to me and I... Yes? Okay. So it's to keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. See, I'm not qualified to talk to you about your experience until I'm sharing an experience with you, and then I'm obligated to tell you I'm sharing an experience with you right now. Right? Because they're, they're thinking something's weird going on. How many of you had that experience? Someone was helping you, and all of a sudden you started having revelation happening within you, and someone just said, there, that's the power we call God. That's how real it is. Gives calm. Who, who just felt that? Somebody just had a recollection and a revelation. There you go. Yeah. Okay, that's the power we call God that's happening in you. Okay. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed who never realize their predicament. Doctors are rightly loath to tell alcoholic patients the whole story unless it will serve some good purpose, but you may talk to them about the hopelessness of alcoholism because you offer a solution. You'll soon have your friend admitting he has many, if not all, the traits of an alcoholic. So we're going to peel it back. We're going to start talking about, I relate to that, I relate to that, I don't really believe in that. Any of you that are working with people have that happen? I don't really believe in God the way you described to me, Joe, but I believe you believe, so I'll believe in your, your belief. Okay. Stick close. I'll show you why I believe. You want to see miracles? This is a miracle factory around here. Come watch. If his own doctor is willing to tell him he's an alcoholic, so much the better. Even though your protege may not have entirely admitted his condition, he's become very curious to know how you got well. Let him ask you that question if he will. So that's pretty explicit instruction. We weren't going to tell him back then because they weren't ready. But now they're cautioning. When he asks, it is my obligation to honor my third step. Does that make sense? And so if you don't get what that looks like, because we often don't hear people talking about his power, his love, his way of life, and giving credit to what I agreed to do, what I have to tell them is I drank and drugged every day, no matter what. I didn't stop unless I got chained up or locked up or hospitalized in some other way. And usually by the time I got hospitalized, I was chained up because my delirium tremens was so significant, I would hit the health workers. And then one day, pow! It never happened again. And I was suddenly willing to do things I had never been willing to do. I was willing to sit down with someone and help me arm myself with the facts about myself. I learned the truth about myself. I took those facts I had learned to the truth within me. 
and the truth within me carried me out from there. I was a dead man coming in. I was a live man walking out. I've never stopped doing that. And as a result, as a result, I have been entrusted with more and more worldly responsibility to make sure more and more people experience the freedom that was given to me. And I can tell you that all of this you're sitting in is a gift from him who lifted me from the scrap heap. That's what it looks like for me. But I've heard some fantastic, amazing stories. You people sitting in this room are going to affect tens of thousands of men and women. You're going to take over communities because your preparation is so profound. Your stories are so profound. You've been preserved for such a time as this. Believe that. We believe it. I was at the legislature all day today. They want to help us do more and more and more for all of you. So, says, tell him exactly what happened to you. Rather than tell you that, I showed you what it might look like for me. Um, stress the spiritual feature freely. Again, I tried to show you what it might look like for me. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic. He does not have to agree with your conception of God. You do not have to. There you go. Power. Love it. You don't have to agree with my conception because God is not a conception. God is power, to your point. Power to reclaim. Power to redeem. Power to restore. Tangible power. Sensory power. Yeah? Okay. And you can start where you are. He can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. So if you just want to be silly, be silly. But if you want to get real and you want to discover that new man or woman within you, then we are honored to walk with you while you have that discovery. Yes? It says the main thing is that he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. What are those spiritual principles? Well, they're contained in the steps, right? So you'll know what they are when they come to you. Simple recovery rules. If you just want to start getting well, be where you say you'll be, when you say you'll be there. Do what you say you'll do, when you say you'll do it. Try showing up and see what happens. I'm not going to get into the religious denomination tonight. I'm going to go over to 94. It says, outline the program of action explaining how you made a self-appraisal. I would have more credibility if I had. I only point that out because people say the steps are optional. Of course they're optional. Everything's optional. I had a guy at a convention one time telling everybody, I'm on a panel with him. And it was supposed to be a panel about... The AA's book. And the guy says, don't worry about that book. You can do AA any way you want to. And he said it to me. I'm in, on the panel with him. I felt like I was going to be struck. And then I realized in the spirit, he's absolutely right. You can do AA any way you want to. But it ain't AA, and you're unlikely to get what they got. That's the truth. It didn't win me any friends, but that's the truth. You, you know why we say it's not AA? If it didn't come out of this book, it's not 12-step recovery, because the roots of 12-step recovery are written down in this book, and no one in this book who told this testimony did 12 steps. They did the five principles of the Oxford groups. And Bill wanted to sell books, so he broke it down to 12, because it had symbolic marketing capability. Which is why this all-inclusive manner of living and this revelation of the spirit within us is sometimes hard to figure out where it fits. Because it isn't until we serve that we start having the big flows of the spirit, right? You start to have a little when you unburden yourself in five and a little more when you start making amends. But when you meet that one person that's as hopeless as you once were and they come into contact with the power and you feel them light up and you have these profound experiences, then you awaken and you understand why we do what we do, right? Okay, 
So it says, outline the program of action, how you made a self-appraisal, how you straightened out your past, and why you're now endeavoring to be helpful to him. Why am I endeavoring to be helpful to him? Because it ensures immunity. Nothing so much ensures immunity as intensive work with others. I, let's not, I, I'm not doing this because I'm a great guy. I'm doing this because I'm hoping to be a better man somewhere down the road. Does this make sense? Okay. It's important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery. Do you realize that? Because I'm not going to be able to convey that to them if I don't believe it. Actually, he may be helping you more than you're helping him. So now the authors are reminding me the truth in my telling him, because I may not believe it. I may think I have a superior method. I needed to be saved, but now I can save you. Actually, I needed to be saved, and I can introduce you to the Savior. Right? Okay. All right, so make it plain that he's under no obligation to you, that you, you hope only that he will try and help other alcoholics when he escapes his own difficulties. Why would I hope that for you? Every one of you who got mentored got told, what are you doing for others? Yes? We started telling you that two years inside. What are you doing for others? Some of you, it wasn't very easy for you to do for others, but you figured out a way, didn't you? Because you made it here. Why do you think we did that? Because we hope you will do that, because that's how we get free. I always get access to more power than I need when I offer it to another. How do you think a place like this gets built? All by faith. All by faith. We had the vision before we had the property. Right? And then we, luckily, God arranged a worldwide pandemic. Amen. Hey, listen. This was not zoned for 400 felons to live here. We got all seven variances and no one showed up at the hearing. By the time we popped up and y'all were here, how'd you, where'd you come from? Well, we had an open hearing. But during COVID, it was all remote and no one bothered to show up. <laughs> and now they love us, right? We had, to, we had to be fully grown for them to see why they needed to do it. Because it, they'd have killed it in its infancy otherwise. Okay, suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. Make it clear that he's not under pressure and that he needn't see you again if he doesn't want to. You should not be offended if he wants to call it off for he's helped you more than you've helped him. Notice how this book is always written to both the new guy and the person trying to lead the new guy. Because they're speaking to me about an experience of I just spent hours with somebody and now they've decided they want to work with someone else. How many of you working with people have had that happen? And you're thinking, you couldn't have told me that before I spent all day Sunday with you? <laughs> but they're, they're causing me to check my thoughts. I've had people call, oh, I wouldn't work with them. They just wasted my time. I go, well, you're really in trouble then. Why, how could they possibly have wasted your time? What did they show you? Did they show you your powerlessness? Did they show you your, your, your egocentric nature that you, you thought you knew better than the spirit within you to talk to these people? Come on, what did they show you? Is it your people pleaser that made you sit there for eight hours hearing the same frickin' story? How many of you have worked with other people and have had that happen and you've learned how to cut that down a little bit? Like, we'll go through that garbage once, but I ain't the garbage can. We either throw that shit away and move on, or y'all sit in it. <laughs> right? Okay. So it says, he's helped you more than you've helped him. If your talk has been sane, quiet, and full of human understanding, you've perhaps made a friend. Maybe you've disturbed him about the question of alcoholism. How many of you got disturbed about the question of alcoholism long before you really sought a solution to alcoholism? How many of you had that happen because you ran into someone, to Paul's point, maybe in a meeting, who seemed pretty chill about the fact that, yeah, I tried that. Give it a go. Come back and let me know how that went for you. Whatever. Have you ever had any of that? And we're thinking they're just being mean, and all they're doing is just casually observing 
themselves act out. Okay. This is all to the good. The more hope he, hopeless he feels, the better. He'll be more likely to follow your suggestions. So you guys that are working with people and you're having trouble finding people ready, it's probably because you're a little too earnest to get them in the process. They'll, they'll drive you. What you'll find when people are really going to get this, they'll drive you. Your candidate may give reasons why he need not follow all the program. Any of you ever had one of those? <laughs> Any of you ever been one of those? He may rebel at the thought of a drastic house cleaning, which requires discussion with other people. Any of you afraid to get look inside yourself and really afraid of the idea of telling somebody else those deep things about yourself? It says, do not contradict such views. Tell him you once felt as he does, but you doubt whether you would have made much progress had you not taken action. So I have to have done this, had this experience, explained to them how I went through a fourth step and I told these embarrassing things to this guy I desperately hoped would like me because no one liked me by that stage of my life. And then I laid these things out to him, but I held back on some things that were particularly embarrassing to me because I figured this guy will not like me if I tell him this. Any of you ever been in that position? And I got all the way through with all that diatribe, and he looked me right in the eye and he said, okay, what are you holding back? <laughs> and I'm sitting, what? How did he know? And then I spilled it, and then all of a sudden I was, felt the delight. I felt unburdened and what have you. But the question is, how did he know? You guys ever heard a fifth step? You guys that haven't done the process... You don't understand, if we've heard a fifth step, number one, if it's got a name, you didn't invent it. We've heard it all if we've done enough. And the fact is, when you hold back, we know. There's going to be a flow of the Spirit when whatever is blocking you off comes out. And the minute that happens, we get a bump. And as people that are prone to like a bump, we're going to call you out on it when you hold our hit. To Tyler's point. So there ain't no point. By the time you get to recovery, you've done all the embarrassing shit you're ever going to have to do. I mean, don't do your fifth step from a podium or you will be judged. But when you're one-on-one, -on -one, get it out because you're going to have to use it to help somebody else dying of that very same thing. That's how you're going to know that the creator has taken all that was intended for harm and turn it for good. Make sense? Okay, so it says that on your first visit, tell him about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if he shows any interest, lend him a copy of this book. So this book details the program and their experience. The fellowship is where we come to share that experience. The modern fellowship, maybe not so much. You'll have to gravitate toward groups that actually know their own testimony as a result of this process or some process so that you can share the spirit, because it's the sharing of the spirit that inspires. Does that make sense? It's the very nature of the word, and spiritus. I want to go to... Oh, I think I'm going to jump over to 96. It says, do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. How many of you are working with others did experience some discouragement because either they kept bouncing or... Dis did they ghosted you? Anybody have that happen? It says, search out another alcoholic and try again. You're sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. To my point, you'll start to recognize them because they'll chase you. You're not chasing them. Does it make sense? And we find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. If you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover by himself. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. So they're not saying that person's wasting their time. They're saying we waste our own time pursuing someone who's not ready. And we have no right to do that because we've been perfectly prepared to help somebody. We just haven't met them yet. Okay. And then it says, one of our fellowship failed entirely with his first half dozen prospects. He says 
He often says that if he'd continued to work on them, he might have deprived many others who have since recovered of their chance. You know who they're talking about? They're speaking of Bill Wilson, who's the author of the majority of this book. So think about the millions of people. Had he given up or continued to pursue those people in the Bowery back in those days, instead of moving on and doing what he did, meeting Bob and meeting all the people in Akron, millions and millions of people would have missed their redemption. And that didn't stop with Bill Wilson. Every one of you has that same charge on you. It's a serious mission we're on, right? Okay. And you know how many, when we talk about tens of thousands, it's tens of thousands, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars will experience the recovery you've experienced if you'll just get armed with the facts and tell the story. Does it make sense? Okay. So now I want to go to, hmm, I'm going to go to page 97. Now, I told you the guy that took me through this process, he was a bit harsh. And he told me that these were the 12-step promises. I've since learned there's others. But said, page 97, never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you're doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once, once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day if need be. Those of you that are students of that other book, you know what it means to act the Good Samaritan. Who is the good neighbor? The Samaritan, who, although he wasn't supposed to help, when the man was found beaten and bloodied on the side of the road, he not only stopped, bandaged his wounds, put him on his own animal, took him to the end, but he paid the innkeeper. He said, I'll come back and settle for him. So we may have to be our brother's keeper for a time, and we may have to do it every day if need be. If, that was what, that, if that's what's put in front of me, that's what I do. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. And then it says, it may mean the loss of many nights' sleep. Yep. Great interference with your pleasures. Yep. Interruptions to your business. Yep. It may mean sharing your money and your home. Yep. Counseling frantic wives and relatives. Innumerable trips to police courts, sanitariums, hospitals, jails, and asylums. Yep. Yeah, are you, how many of you made innumerable trips to jails, asylums, police courts, hospitals? Do you understand now that 12 is the big amends? Nine was just enough to get me fit, to get past my own judgments. The amended life is this life. Yeah. I ended up in lots of jails and asylums. And people I don't know and never knew still came to inspire me in that time. And I don't know what seed they planted in me, but here I am. Yeah. Right? Does it make sense? Yeah. So your, your telephone may jangle at any time of the day or night. Your wife may sometimes say she's neglected. Because you neglected her. <laughs> a drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. You may have to fight with him if he's violent. Sometimes you'll have to call a doctor and administer sedatives under his direction. And another time you may have to send for the police or an ambulance. Occasionally you have to meet such conditions. So I was told these are the 12 step promises. I've since learned that this is just so I can come to understand that to live an amended life, I'm gonna re rewalk the path I walked through oblivious and I'm going to go pick up people and show them how to walk out of that situation I once did not know how to walk out of. Because the one thing I do know is I know how I got there and I know the way out. And when I was there, I didn't know the way out. So if I want my life to be purposeful, I'm going to have to use everything I was ever given. And the grace that I was given in that time has manifested into a powerful faith in this time. Does that make sense? Okay. So I got to jump from there to 98. Last week we talked about steps 10 and 11, and they said it was time to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And we talked about what growing in understanding might be, but we told you then that to grow in effectiveness, we're going to leave you hanging a little bit, and then we're going to talk about what they witnessed growing in effectiveness meant. Does it make sense? So that's what we're going to talk about right now. Page 98, the first paragraph, it says, it's not the matter of giving that's in question, but when and how to give. Yes. So you're going to have to 
you're going to have to consult the Spirit because sometimes we give and it's harmful and sometimes we, we judge and we don't give or sometimes we don't give respectfully or we, we don't give without attachment. And so when we do things for the wrong reasons, even though it's a good thing for the wrong reason, the effect is not the same on the life I touch or myself. Does that make sense? So we're now, because we're growing in consciousness at this point, awareness of being aware of this power in and on my life. Does that make sense? Okay. So it says that often makes the difference between failure and success. The minute we put our work on a service plane, the alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. That, there you go. So that, that's the people that are either people-pleasing or we're, we're, we're enabling them, right? But that doesn't mean disrespect. I mean, you can, you can be respectful and tell them you're not going to do what they ask. I'll listen to you. I'll take you to a treatment center. I'll buy you a meal. But I may not do exactly what you specify because I'm growing in effectiveness and I know what you want is not what you need. Does that make sense? And I know this because the Spirit told me and I have been informed from my own experience what happens when I get something I want but I don't need. Um, and then it says, he clamors for this or that, claiming he cannot master alcohol until his material needs are cared for. Nonsense. Why do they say that so emphatically? How many of you had great material need? Like took it right, up, right off the rails? Living in the car or under the car? Or on the yard? or Yeah, cash homeless shelter. Or beside the shelter, depending on whether you didn't get there on time. Some of, you, some of you must be. I don't even want to talk about that overflow experience. Um, some of us have taken very hard to, knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place, place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence upon God. And if you'll think about it logically, if I'm dependent on things worldly, when the power to live resides in me, I've placed my dependence on a known, failing, temporal experience. And so I'm going to have to, I mean, I had all that stripped away so I could find that I needed access to this power within me. And indeed, there, that power was there. And then I started realizing as I looked back, learning to tell my story, that that power had always been there, just as Bill talks about. And then all of a sudden I've got fit fellowship with Bill, right? Okay, so it says, burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God. Oh, that was weak. Come on, this, that was your cue to get it big. Trust in God. Oh, they heard you in Abilene. All right. The only condition is you trust in God and clean house. I'm going to jump from there one more thing because we need to get out of here. Um, hmm. Oh, here it is, 102. Your job now is to be at the place where you can be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives. What motives? I'm endeavoring to be helpful. I'm not going in there to get a glimmer of whatever. I'm going wherever it is I'm going with a sincere desire to be helpful. And it says, keep on the firing line of life with these motives and God will keep you unharmed. There you go. You're on it. 